Timothy James McVeigh, a name that will always remind us of terror, sadness, loss and grief. McVeigh was born on April 23, 1968, in Lockport, New York, the only son and the second of three children of his Irish-American parents. McVeigh was raised Roman Catholic. During his childhood, he and his father attended Mass regularly. McVeigh was confirmed at the Good Shepherd Church in Pendleton, New York, in 1985. Most who knew McVeigh remember him as being very shy and withdrawn, while a few described him as an outgoing and playful child who withdrew as an adolescent. He is said to have had only one girlfriend as an adolescent. While in high school McVeigh became interested in computers, and hacked into government computer systems on his Commodore 64 under the handle The Wanderer, taken from the song by Dion. In his senior year he was named most promising computer programmer of Starpoint Central High School as well as most talkative by his classmates as a joke as he did not speak much but had relatively poor grades until his 1986 graduation. The childhood of Timothy McVeigh in Lockport, New York was far from idyllic. His parents divorced in 1978 when Tim was 10, and for the remainder of his school years he lived mainly with his father, Bill McVeigh. Scrawny and unathletic, Noodle McVeigh became a target for neighborhood bullies. He attributes a lifelong hatred for bullies of all kinds, a class which, in his view, included an overreaching federal government to early beatings on softball diamonds and head-spinning swirlies in flushing toilets. It is possible that McVeigh's fascination with guns, dating to pre-teen years spent admiring his grandfather's 22 caliber rifle, might have something to do with his view of weapons as the great equalizer. He dedicated himself to developing his marksmanship skills, spending hours shooting holes in soft drink cans in a ravine. By age 14, Tim McVeigh's interests included survivalism. He began stockpiling food and camping equipment in preparation for possible nuclear attack or a communist overthrow of the United States government. For two years following high school graduation, McVeigh briefly attended a computer school in Buffalo and took on a series of short-term jobs. Then, in May 1988, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. In basic training, the loner McVeigh found a friend in his platoon leader, Terry Nichols, who shared his conservative and somewhat paranoid political views. McVeigh seemed to fit well into the structured life of the military, performing well enough to be promoted to sergeant. He served in Fort Riley, Kansas, where he met Michael Fortier, the man who would later provide key testimony against him in the Oklahoma City bombing trial. From Fort Riley, McVeigh headed to the Persian Gulf War, where for four months he drove a Bradley fighting vehicle and, for his efforts, earned a Bronze Star. McVeigh seemed well suited to the details of military life. His army years were probably his best years. Nonetheless, after realizing that he liked the right stuff during the first day of a Green Beret tryout, McVeigh requested and received an honorable discharge in December 1991. McVeigh's life darkened in the year following his discharge. By the end of 1991, McVeigh was living with his father again in upstate New York, near Buffalo, and working for near minimum wage as a security guard. He fought through bouts of serious depression and thoughts of suicide. Politically, he moved further and further from the mainstream. He began espousing increasingly angry views of U.S. foreign policy, gun control, and what he believed were conspiracies involving the United States. In January 1993, McVeigh turned in his security company badge, sold most of his belongings, packed his bags, left New York, 
and began a transient life of gun shows, stays with army buddies, and short-term jobs. Gun shows provided McVeigh with money and a steady stream of acquaintances who shared his anti-gun control and anti-government views. There is no shortage of people in the United States who have serious beefs with the federal government. In addition to the anti-gun control crowd, there are anti-tax fanatics, white supremacists who resent government's race and immigration policies, and a wide variety of persons who think the United States government is full of communists or one world government proponents. In Kingman, Arizona, McVeigh renewed his friendship with Army buddy Michael Fortier, an anti-gun control protester with a passion for far-right politics. In the fall of 1993, McVeigh and Terry Nichols made their first visit to Elohim City, a hotbed of anti-government activity, including a plot to blow up a federal building in Oklahoma City. In March 1995, when Terry Nichols told McVeigh that he wanted to back out of the bombing plan, McVeigh had to turn elsewhere for the assistance he would need in the final stages of the plot. There is speculation that his help came from Elohim City. McVeigh wanted to be seen as the mastermind of the plot, and in his statements discounted the role of others in the conspiracy, leaving uncertainty as to exactly what roles others played. On April 5th, two minutes after a phone call to the Ryder Rental Company made from his motel room in Kingman, McVeigh placed a call to Elohim City. The contents of that phone conversation are unknown, of course, but there has been considerable speculation in books and on internet sites that McVeigh sought to coordinate bombing plans with some compound residents. Three days after his phone call, McVeigh arrived in Oklahoma, where he was seen at Lady Godiva's, a Tulsa strip club, in the presence of Elohim City militants Andreas Strasmere and a third man, who some people suggest might have been Michael Brescia. A security camera in a dressing room at the strip club apparently recorded McVeigh telling a stripper, on April 19th, you'll remember me for the rest of your life. For Timothy McVeigh, April 19th stood out as a date with multiple historical meanings. It was, probably foremost to the former visitor to Waco, the date in 1995 that the federal government launched its attack on the Branch Davidian compound in Texas, with the horrific loss of life that resulted. On the morning that he would become the greatest mass murderer in American history, McVeigh, began driving south in his rider truck from Ponca City about 7 a.m. on the morning of April 19th, having made an executive decision to move up the scheduled timing of the bombing. In the more sensational version of events related in Secrets Worth Dying For, McVeigh, with Michael Brescia in the passenger seat of the rider truck, left at Oklahoma City warehouse around 8 a.m. at 8.45. McVeigh pulled the truck into an Oklahoma City tire store to ask directions. According to the store employee who talked with McVeigh, a second man wearing a baseball cap sat in the passenger seat of the vehicle as McVeigh sought directions to a downtown address six blocks away. A video camera at 8.55 a.m. captured the rider truck as it headed toward the center of downtown Oklahoma City. The rider truck drove up NW 5th Street shortly before 9 o'clock. McVeigh lit two fuses. He parked the truck in the handicapped zone in front of the Alfred P. Murray Federal Building, locked the vehicle, and strode quickly away in the direction of a nearby YMCA building. At 9.02 a.m., shortly after many parents had dropped their toddlers, off at the Murray Building's second floor daycare center, the bomb exploded, taking with it much of the building, killing 167 people, injuring another 509, and changing forever the lives of thousands of Oklahomans. 
The damage to the building was so extensive that many people believe there were in fact two blasts. The second coming from an ATF. Secure area where explosives being stored were ignited by the truck bomb. Both seismic evidence and witness testimony supports the two blast theory. By April 21st, investigatory trails had led to Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. Initial speculation that the bombing was the work of Arab extremists faded away. The lead FBI investigator at Waco, Clinton Van Zandt of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, recognized the importance of April 19th and told other agents to look for a white male with military experience and a member of some militia group angry for what happened at Ruby Ridge and Waco. Agents visiting Elliot's body shop in Junction City, the shop that rented the rider truck, came away with a description of renter Robert Kling, also known as John Dono. 1. A white male with a brush cut and a strong nose. The manager of the Dreamland Motel told them that John Dono. 1. Looked very much like Timothy McVeigh, who had rented a room at her motel in the days before the bombing. A former co-worker in New York also told authorities that John Dono 1. Might be the man he knew as Timothy McVeigh. On June 2, 1997, McVeigh was found guilty on all 11 counts of the federal indictment. Although 168 people, including 19 children, were killed in the April 19, 1995, bombing, Murder charges were brought against McVeigh for only the eight federal agents who were on duty when the bomb destroyed much of the Murrah building. Along with the eight counts of murder, McVeigh was charged with conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction and destroying a federal building. Oklahoma City District Attorney Bob Macy said he would file state charges in the other 160 murders after McVeigh's co-defendant, Terry Nichols, was tried. After the verdict, McVeigh tried to calm his mother by saying, Think of it this way. When I was in the army, you didn't see me for years. Think of me that way now, like I'm away in the army again on an assignment for the military. McVeigh was executed by lethal injection at 7.14 a.m. on June 11, 2001, the first federal prisoner to be executed since Victor Fagier was executed in Iowa on March 15, 1963. On the evening of June 10, 2001, McVeigh had his last meal two pints of chocolate chip ice cream, the next morning. He woke early to take a shower. At 7 a.m., dressed in a shirt, khaki pants and slip-on shoes, McVeigh was led to the execution chamber. A restrained team strapped him to a padded gurney. The curtains over glass panels separating the chamber from a viewing area parted to allow 30 people to directly watch McVeigh's final moments while another 300 victims and relatives gathered in Oklahoma City to watch the event on closed-circuit television. McVeigh made no final statement, but instead left a handwritten copy of the poem Invitus, with its concluding lines, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Warden Harley Lapan read an official statement and then said, We are ready as the drugs entered his veins. McVeigh lifted his head and made eye contact with witnesses in the viewing room. He was pronounced dead at 7.14 a.m. Timothy James McVeigh was 33 years at the time of his execution. Thank you for watching Death Row.